Hello, everyone, and welcome to our ECOM seminar today. My name is Ivan Ortega, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, James Hannigan. Uh, Jim received his undergrad from Colorado State University in Fort Collins in physics. Uh, after that, Jim went to do his grad work at the University of Denver in atmospheric sciences and focusing on infrared spectroscopy. He started at NCAR in 1991, working with airborne infrared spectrometers and later with ground-based systems that are part of the network for the detection of atmospheric composition change or ENDAC. In 2004, uh, Jim was selected co-chair of the infrared working group and to the ENDAC steering committee. And he currently, he is managing three ENDAC instruments, one in Thule in Greenland, one in Hawaii, in Mauna Loa and one here in Boulder. Uh, just a little bit about the presentation today. So today we are using a Slido uh, to, to post questions, uh, which you can ask at any time during the seminar. If you are not familiar with the Slido, you can scroll down the webpage of the presentation where you are right now and you can see the Slido interface at the bottom of the webpage. Questions will be passed to Jim at the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you, Jim, I appreciate it. And please take it away. Uh, the virtual stage, it, it is yours. Okay. Well, thank you, Yvonne. And uh, thank you everybody for coming and I'm very happy to be here. And I'm gonna talk today about uh, global trends in carbonyl sulfide that were measured uh, across the globe from 22 different uh, NDAC stations. And uh, I'm doing this work um, with uh, Ivan and, uh, and um, Shima Baramvesh Shams, who's a graduate student uh, from the University of Washington or Washington State University. She's been visiting us. And of course, with the help um, in collaboration with all of the uh, infrared working group teams that are part of the NDAC. So uh, a little bit about um, what this is, what the talk's going to look like. I'm going to talk about uh, our motivation, how we got here, why we're why we're interested in, in OCS. I want to say a little bit about the um, previous measurements um, and, uh, and ours in the context of those. Then a, then a, a bit general and more specific about NDAC, the, uh, the, the larger NDAC, and then the infrared inf instrumentation that are used here. And then um, retrieval and information content. So that try to de define how we get to a columns and partial columns of, of carbonyl sulfide. Then we'll look at the uh, trend data um, in these uh, that for OCS, and um, we're going to look at uh, um, trying to understand this in the context of the changes with um, dynamical changes with in the stratosphere. Um, we want to explore the latitudinal distribution because we have such a wide range and also annual cycles and follow that with conclusions. So the motivation um, for the most part initially came from uh, uh, the, the uh, stratospheric sulfur and its role in climate, the SSIRC is a subgroup of SPARC and they're interested in um, creating a uh, uh, an inventory and uh, to understand that the uh, stratospheric sulfur burden. This was something um, I first was contacted with by Terry Deschler a number of years ago. And um, there's been, uh, since that time, there's been a number of, of publications looking at different parts, um, different stations or different, different aspects. But um, here in the NDAC, we have sort of a global view. And so we wanted to be able to to look at this this global distribution using our our NDAC, um sites, um, so the so the keen or I guess the most important part there is that it's, it initiated from trying to understand the stratospheric sulfur aerosol layer. Um, this particular so our work here now is actually built on a, a bit of um, other infrared uh, measurements. Um, a couple of years ago, there was. Uh, um, Lejeune at all did a, did a detailed study of OCS 
um, looking at the uh, young fry yak data. Um, I would say that there's been a long history of, of looking at OCS uh, from infrared spectrometers that go back into the into the late 70s. Um, and so so there's a lineage there, but the most recent work from the ground is really based by on work by Lejeune. Um, Yu Ting Wang at Bremen did a study looking um, at another aspect of, of OCS, but using the FTIR station, several of them. And she was looking at uh, tropospheric OCS and how that relates to plant respiration. Uh, Stephanie Kremser has been um, pretty key in looking at uh, sulfur, stratospheric sulfur, stratospheric aerosols. And she did a, a study looking just at a, a couple of um, Southern Hemisphere infrared working group stations. And also um, Kristofiak in 2015 used NDAC stations for uh, latitudinal work. They didn't really look at trends. They were looking at latitudinal distributions and compared it with balloon-borne measurements from Spiral and, and the Mark IV spectrometer. So uh, OECS is um, somewhat, somewhat complicated. Um, it has a number of direct, um, direct and indirect sources and um, and sinks they, um, there's a lot uh, a lot of the uh, sulfur and sulfur containing gases that come out of the ocean eventually go into OCS. OCS has a fairly long lifetime as opposed to um, um, CS2 and DMS. Um, most of the sulfur that eventually comes out of uh, out of different sources, most of the sulfur bearing gases eventually go into OCS. Um, it can also come from biomass burning and volcanoes. Um, there's an excellent review of, of the tropospheric aspects of OCS by Whalen et al. in Biogeosciences that goes into and really tries to understand OCS in the context of re plant respiration and trying to understand the carbon cycle and, and respiration of CO2. Um, one of the more recent um, sort of wild cards to some extent is the anthropogenic sources. Um, there's um, been work um, recently shows that the uh, inventory of, of, uh, of anthropogenic sources has been tending to go up, um, has some uh, inflection points that coincide with what some of the measurements that we'll show. And so um, the anthropogenic sources probably play a large role in what we're gonna describe in this talk. The lifetime, um, anywhere from two and a half to about six years, um, recently re revised down from, uh, from an earlier lifetime. So that's the tropospheric lifetime. So um, that's why create that's, it's very stable in the troposphere and uh, accumulates most of the sulfur, sulfur sources. The stratospheric lifetime is more along lines of 68, from 58 to 68 years, depending on latitude. Um, and in short, the uh, OCS, the budget is, um, is time dependent, as we'll show. It's um, not completely understood. It's um, got a large anthropogenic and not well understood anthropogenic source. It's, it's important for, for uh, understanding plant respiration and in maintaining the stratospheric aerosol layer. This is a graphic taken from um, Stephanie's paper in Review Geophysics which, uh, about stratospheric aerosol, um, showing, the, showing most, for the most part, the sulfur budget in general. In particular, um, she used a lot of um, components of a model from Shang et al. In particular, over here, we sh he shows that uh, about 420 um, gigagrams of sulfur is transported into the stratosphere via OCS um, per year. And then also a loss of about 380, yielding a net, a net of about 40 gigagrams of sulfur into the stratosphere. Um, that 40 gigagrams is estimated to be 56 to 70% of the, um, provides sulfur to 56 to 70% 70, 70 of the aerosol burden. Um, so therefore, the, the OCS, um, there are other, lots of other sources, direct sources of SO2. There's SO2 
from volcanoes. There's high concentrations during direct injection and lower um, injection. There are lower a lower amount that that gets that gets transported um, via lower uh, smaller volcanoes. But uh, OCS plays a key role in maintaining this maintaining this. I would say that this the uh, Estimates here are also based on a steady state um, OCS in the stratosphere, which um, I think that's something we'll have something to say about. There are some previous um, studies um, based on aircraft measurements here on the left. So this is a paper that Mike and I did, uh, Mike Coffey and I did uh, several years ago, looking at a long-term trend of uh, airborne measurements from an FTIR starting back in 1978. Um, these are measurements taken at multiple multiple aircraft campaigns. They're largely a latitude range of 30 to 60 north, and basically said that there was a, a positive but not significant trend um, in the column of OCS uh, above the 200 hectopascal um, isobar. Uh, a similar kind of uh, analysis was done by, by Jeff Toon. This was uh, recently published um, just a couple of years ago, and then, uh, similar in that in that it's a multiple different air uh, balloon flights taken over a long period of time between uh, 1990 to 2015, and um, from multiple different latitudes, but generally northern mid latitudes, 33 to 68 north, and um, due to the uh, being at high altitude float float levels of you know 30 plus kilometers and looking at sunrise and sunsets there he's able to really um, look not just at columns but um, but be able to determine uh, trace gases along uh, at specific altitude levels and so in, in this case he equated uh, his OCS to the n2o 250 bar 50 um, millibar 250 BPB isopleth of N2O, but basically it came back with that they saw no significant trend. Um, oops, sorry. In, uh, as far as satellite measurements go, there was a publication recently or a few years ago, uh, MEPAS, which showed a northern hemisphere, an actual decline of northern hemisphere um, in the lower, trap, lower stratosphere. No trends in the upper troposphere. This is between 2002 and 2012, so a narrower range of time. Um, not and uh, yes, yeah, so we will see similar things from the ground, and then a weak positive trend in the southern hemisphere during that same time period. Um, more recent um, ground-based measurements. So the so the paper by Lejeune showed net positive trends that that vary, and so. Um, and then uh, Stephanie's paper, looking at the southern hemisphere on three different sites, also show net positive in, in trends in, in both the troposphere and the stratosphere, and that they vary. Um, so a little bit about the NDAC and the and what we're uh, the context in which we take these measurements. The NDAC is, uh, as Yvonne said, is a network for detection of atmospheric composition change. It was um, started back in 1991, 1990, give or take, actually here in Boulder. Um, it's uh, grown, it's, has, it's grown to over 70 stations around the globe. Um, it's there to uh, establish long-term databases to look at trends and, and changes in atmospheric composition. Um, you could read there on the side all the different uh, things in our uh, in our goals and results, but I don't want to go through all those. But um, it's had a, it's been able to coordinate, um, in coordinate uh, measurements along different instrumentation groups, and by doing that, really homogenize what the instruments can do around the globe, and in doing that, being able to be having these multiple stations that are based that are all independent. There's no, there's no uh, central funding for any of this. So they're all all PI run stations, but coordinate how they do their measurements, how they do their retrievals, how they determine uncertainties, in order to say something globally about any number of of trace gases, um, temperature, uh, uh, radiation, there's, and uh, across a number of different um, 
instrumentation, uh, different kinds of instrumentation of which our infrared working group is just one. Um, so we have, we run these FTIR instruments. Um, they're high resolution broadband mid uh, instruments. Um, on the left here is sort of a schematic of our instruments that are in remote places. Uh, we look at the sun. Uh, we have some instrumentation to tell us whether or not we should open the door for the day. We definitely need liquid nitrogen to look in the mid infrared. And they run, our instruments basically run um, autonomously. Um, some other groups run manually, they're actually on site. Some other groups log in and run them that way. Um, and on the right here shows all the different species that the FTIR can measure because it's because it's broadband, because it's high resolution, because it has high signal noise looking at the sun. Um, we can we can measure an, any number of different gases. The ones on the left here in red are ones that are mandated by NDAC that we have to, uh, in order to call ourselves members, we have to submit to the to the publicly available archive. The ones in the center are species that pretty much all sites can measure, and the ones on the right here are some species that maybe um, during a certain pollution episodes or, or times of the year you can measure at different different sites may be able to measure some of these species. Uh, and just a little close up of some of the instrumentation that we have. This instrument in the center is up in Thule, Greenland. This is the solar tracker on the roof up up there. Um, here is our boulder, boulder lab and our boulder instrument, and over here at Mauna Loa. So these are the threes that we have. As I talk through this, I'll show up, up here, you can see that in Thule we started in 99, boulder in 2010, uh, Mauna Loa in 1991. All of the sites that I'll be showing data from all have a different start sites, a start time. So we have to keep aware when looking at some of the trends that not all of our fully representative represented it uh, equally. Um, so the, here are the here are the instruments uh, stations that we're using um, for OCS. Um, they run from the furthest north at 80 degrees north at Eureka. There are several here. Four Karuna's on the Arctic Circle, so four at or above the Arctic Circle. It's concentration here in uh, Europe. There are several, a couple in, in North America, three sites, Altamone is at uh, 4,000 meters. Um, Mauna Loa is as well. Also, Izan is at 2,000 meters. So, Jungfrau Yak and Zugspitz are also high altitude. Others are, are closer to sea level, uh, Arrival Heights and Wollongong. So, we have a pretty reasonable representation, clearly weighted into the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but uh, that's our that's what we will call our global representation. So I mentioned earlier how it's a mandate or part of fundamental to the NDAC to be able to do homogeneous measurements, sometimes referred to as harmonization. Basically, we want to be as identical as possible. And in general, uh, for the mandatory species, we have pre presets for pretty much all of the retrieval parameters. We pretty much have all identical instruments. Uh, wasn't the case in the early days, but it's largely true today. And um, so some of these things that, that we want to make sure are all these retrieval parameters, these inputs to our forward models, so that when we do a retrieval, uh, we know that we know that we're all looking at the same things, taking the same things into account. There's a limits to how well you can do this. There are sites if you're at if you're at Reunion Island on Saint Denis and you're near the coast and there's tremendous amounts of water vapor in the air, you your your spectral view through the mid infrared is simply not the same as if you're at the top of the Yak. So there are some variations that have to be have to be accounted for. We, we try to do this as most reasonably as we can. Um, but in order, but, and uh, we do this for our normal gases for OCS. This was not one of our standard gases that where these details have already been worked out. So we spend a lot of time working this out initially for, um, uh, for this study. And as I said, we followed, we followed a lot of um, what Lejeune had done for Jungfrau Yak. Um, we examined different, um, 
uh, spectroscopic parameters. These are given mostly in HITRAN. Um, there's another list put together by Jeff called ATM, slightly slight variation. We explore both of these. Uh, we'll show a quick example later. You know, OC, o, ozone turns out to be one of the one of the biggest issues in, for an interfering gas in that it uh, line parameters are not as not as good as they we would like them to be. Um, we create a covariance matrix and a priori uh, that, uh, for the globe, for everyone on the globe. I'll explain a little bit how we did that. Um, we use a similar similar intercorrelations. This has, has to do with creating a, 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 a covariance for our retrievals and so that they're homogeneous. Um, and then we all use, look at the same spectral uh, features. We all take into account the uh, same interfering interfering species. Typically, in the past, we've worked um, with uh, the Wacom team, and we've created profiles using Wacom for all of our all of our gases. And uh, we take a mean value over a long period of time. Um, and uh, this has been very useful, widely widely used beyond actually the NDAC, and um, and has been a very uh, very useful way in which um, our retrievals can be homogeneous. Um, OCS was not available in that, so we had to come up with a different technique. And um, so what we did, and this sort of harkens back to years before there were no model data, pretty much retrievals were always done based on other measured data. And so in this case, we basically did that. Um, there were a few different global data sets, not very much for OCS, um, but we we um, we used the Hippo aircraft campaign, and we used uh, it sort of has a, a wide latitude uh, range they studied over a course of several um, several seasons, and so we acquired that OCS data set. Then we acquired the um, ACE FTS version three five, and um, that gives us a stratospheric component to our a priori profile. So we use these, we, we uh, smooth these, average these over several uh, latitude bins that we determined were, were had sort of reasonable amount of change within them. We didn't want to do this for every site or wanted to make it a little more tractable. Um, and so we, um, after we, after we averaged and smoothed, we got these two plots on the left. The one on the right is the standard deviation of all the data that we accumulated based on latitude ranges. These ranges are um, so high latitudes so 50 to 90 north, then then 20 to 50, then 20 to 20 south, and the same in the southern hemisphere. We found that there's an offset in. Um, between HIPPO in the troposphere and what ACE was producing in the stratosphere. We also realized that the number of other groups had found similar, similar changes. This is a comparison with uh, MIPAS and ACE. So we simply decided to um, shift the, the ACE over to the, um, over to the HIPPO data and created our profiles and our, and our final um, essay. So these are these are now latitudinally binned. They're fairly homogeneous, um, and you can see here for just for comparison, um, Jeff's u values of his um, a priori for use in the Mark IV. So one, one, this one's in lower lower latitudes. This one's up in the Arctic, and these are um, so ours are significantly higher, especially in the troposphere. Um, so this is how we get a, uh, in part, how we get homogeneous retrievals across the globe. This is an example of what our what a fits will look like. So after after we do a nonlinear least squares fit using optimal estimation, we get uh, we get um, fits that look like this. In particular, the upper plots are the residuals, and the lower plots, this orange and blue, are the uh, the blue is the uh, observed spectra. The orange is the fitted spectra. This red line will be the OCS line, the one we're after. And these other curves are species that were, are in the region that we have to account for. Um, so the, all of those, for those scholars, are all the same. That's the OCS, the OCS. And in particular, you can see these high residuals that 
that we would prefer not to have, um, largely due to these very small ozone absorption features. So once we do, when we are taking or doing a retrieval, um, the things we, we do is to learn, we take a derivative and to learn the sensitivity of the forward model to the state vector. So that's given by the Jacobi in here, K, partial, partial spectra, partial state vector. And a plot of that is over here on the right. And it shows on the, in the, on the abscissa are these four separate regions where there are four discrete um, OCS lines. And, uh, and then on the, on the uh, ordinate uh, is the altitude. And so this shows, shows the um, sensitivity that our, our um, spectra have to, uh, to the pro vertical profile. And so you can see that a clearly a couple features, I guess, that there's a width to it. And that, that width has to do with pressure broadening, which is where our, basically our information comes from for the most part. The, um, the spectroscopy is different for each of these lines. And you can see how the one um, at the lowest wave number, it goes a little deeper into the troposphere. Um, they all sort of taper off at 20, 20 kilometers. Um, there's about 5,000 spectral points that go into 500 and 500 spectral points across these four regions. And so what's important to know is that the higher, the higher the altitude we want to get, we're looking at the Doppler cores of each of these lines at 20 and above. And we're really down to a few spectral elements, which means the signal noise on those elements has to be great, which is what we get with the modern spectrometers. In the retrieval, there's uh, something called the gain function, which um, tells us the sensitivity of the retrieval to the measurement. And the, the retrieval has other added components, whereas the, the, the Jacobian talks about the state vector, so our a priori uh, the mixing ratio profile, the thing that we're after. The prior knowledge of about that and our instrument are given by the covariance of that a priori and the, and the uh, error or noise in the measurement. So this is basically our signal to noise. And so by combining those, those aspects of, the, of a priori information, we get a value, uh, we, get, we understand what our, what our retrieval is going to do to the spectra. And then to characterize the actual retrieved state, is the product of G and K, and that's the averaging kernels. And so um, we use the averaging kernels. I would say that, the, so I already stated, we use that, we use the, uh, a, uh, basically a climatological, an observation-based climatological essay in order to understand the variance that we might see in our OCS that may or may not coincide or have much to do with the actual sensitivity of the OCS. But we combine that, the, that information now to get the averaging kernels. And we use the averaging kernels now to understand our sensitivity um, in the atmosphere and how much information we can get out of the measurement. But in the context of a global network where we have 22 different instruments operating, it's a measure of the consistency of how we're doing our retrievals. We expect to be there to be some variation. We expect because the profiles vary with the altitude because uh, they're possibly inter interfering species because there's a different altitude range. Some sites are at the sea level, some not. But all in all, what we're showing here on the right now for each of our stations is the uh, is the actual um, are the cover are the uh, the averaging kernels. The, the, the uh, middle plot here is the um, total column averaging kernel. So it's giving you a feel for where the information comes from when we talk to co total column. And on the right are the cumulative um, degrees of freedom. So a measure of how, much, uh, how many discrete pieces of information that we can retrieve out of our, of our instruments. And they vary. Typically, they're higher at, higher at um, northern or high latitudes. And they vary between about two, two and three. Um, another thing I'll say about this plot: we've color coded this according to the five bins, that latitude bins that um, 
that we have started out with for our a priori information. Um, so these are the northern, northernmost. They'll always be. They'll be all the same. I'll show a number of plots that look just like this. Um, the uh, let's see. The green is the Mauna Loa, Altamonte, Paribaribo. These are the these are the ones nearest the equator. Okay, so this is our um, uh, all of our data for the um, total for the uh, profiles. And um, the the red are the uh, a priori, and the blue the blue is the um, retrieved and the one standard deviation. And by and large, um, for the most part, these are we we're, can see we don't we believe we don't really have any bias between uh, with our uh, between the a priori and the um, and the retrieved data that we that we've got. Um, we're going to do a, some processing to our data in order to understand what we want to do. We want to get out different levels. And so um, we did, we wanted to understand, we wanted to remove any, as much as we could about the, with the, having to do with the variation of the, of the tropopause height. And so we did some statistics on the tropopause height and um, created, um, and we binned. Um, the altitudes of the tropopause height, and then we created uh, vertical pro vertical layers that we're gonna the plots to follow, and this uh, will and trends will be on these different layers, and they'll have and um, we wanted to stay away from the in order to remove the effect of the tropopause variations. We wanted to stay away, so we basically go from surface to four kilometers is one layer, four to the tropopause height minus two standard deviations, and then from tropopause height plus two standard deviations up to the 40 kilometers, but basically top of the atmosphere, top uh, beyond our sensitivity. Um, we're going to process the data to remove annual cycles. And so we use um, uh, a polynomial to look at the, to look at our, uh, the change in the, the, the change, uh, slower varying changes. And then, um, several Fourier terms to remove the annual cycle. And we'll look at anomalies that are basically, that are gonna be the um, partial column of a given layer minus those Fourier components. Later on, we'll look at, we'll use a higher order polynomial to do, to look at inflections in the long-term anomaly trends. So we started with the total columns. So this is all data. Um, and um, we, we chose to plot all of these on the same um, ordinate scale. So um, uh, we can look we, for ease of viewing. Um, some sites that have very low values are often because they're actually at high, high, high altitude. They don't really have much of a tropospheric component, uh, like Young Yak, like Mount Aloha. And um, a few things to say is that uh, here, here, this includes the uh, annual cycles. Um, we have uh, San Denis and Mido, which are two sites that are actually very near each other on Reunion Island. One is early, and then later on, the site was moved over, was put up at, at Mido. So this one was at sea level. This one's at two, about two kilometers. So we later on, we combine those two sites as one site. A number of sites have gaps in the data, and we feel this probably has going to have an effect on trends, particularly, excuse me, Scuba, uh, Rekabetsu, Mauna Loa has a number of gaps. So have to take this into account. So after we remove the, um, the Fourier terms, we see, um, we see the long-term anomalies. Um, we, we're plotting here from 84 to 2020 because Young Fourier starts in around 1986. Most sites don't start that, uh, most sites start in much later than that. Um, and, uh, what we eventually get to, which is similar to previous the previous work, was that there's a lot of inflection down in near near 2000 between 2000 and 2002, and then later on near 2008 2009. Um, most recently, we started to add, and a few sites have have given us data up to 2020, and we really see a fall off, which seems ubiquitous across the globe. More recently. Um, 
But then there are sites that don't follow those those trends. Scuba, you know, really see, looks like it, it's been falling off since 2012. Uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, really has a, a quite a different um, view it, measurements there in the total column. So uh, not all not all uh, sites quite see quite the same. Even though some of the, some of these um, features, like these these discrete linear time frames, are seem fairly ubiquitous. So now, if we list, we take this now, I'm looking at just the um, individual layers. So um, we take a, a, a mean uh, uh, mixing ratio. So this is basically, would, I would basically say a, it's a weighted VMR. And um, it's a, it, we, take a, we take the layers in a particular altitude regime, and then we weight it by the mass, the mixing ratio by the mass. So the units are in here in PPT. So they're easy to see. They're also still also on the same, same grid, uh, same, uh, same ordinate scale excuse me and now we plot also here three um three different uh linear regimes so between 2002 before 2002 2002 to 2008 and then 2008 to 2019 and um for many sites and uh, we we found that these give us um fairly good uh linear regimes and it's discrete regimes it's but again, it's not true for every site. Um, the free troposphere, again, um, now we have a longer term series with Jungfrau-Jauk because it doesn't have a tr lower tropospheric regime. Um, and then in the stratosphere, so the uh, Stratosphere has much more more variability than the others, but again, we can we're we're trying to look at the big picture and look at the discrete regimes. So to summarize these data, we have uh, this um, bar chart shows um, how things have changed in the longer ter longest term, and then um, our three three discrete regimes. So um, of note here in 1986 to 2019, each of these stations starts at a different time frame. Young Freyak is the longest in the 80, 96, but most of the others, uh, 86, pardon me, but most of the others start much later. Um, uh, what we can see is a small positive trend. So green is stratosphere, blue is the free troposphere, red is the, red is the lower troposphere. Um, most of these, except Mauna Loa, show positive trends of about between 0.2 to 0.5 or 6 percent per year. Um, during this regime, 1996, leading into 2002, many of the all of the all of these tropospheric values are negative, up to a percent per year, while the well, for the most part, the um, stratosphere is is still continuing to to uh, to increase. Um, during the later part of the OOs, 2002-2008, it's um, everything are, except a few sites are seen to be increasing in the stratosphere and the troposphere. Um, that's not the case here for um, for Toronto in the stratosphere, nor Wollongong in the stratosphere, and we'll probably get to talking about Wollongong a little bit later. Um, and then the most recent trends. If we look just at the just at the stratosphere here in the northern mid latitudes, stratosphere has been increasing quite a bit all the way down to Rekabetsu, but then also here in um, Scuba and down to Izania, which is about at 30 degrees north. When we get to Mauna Loa and Altamoni, which are about at 20, where it's large negative values in, in the stratosphere. Those are, Paramaribo here, which is at six degrees north, shows still shows somewhat of a positive, positive value. Um, then again, in um, uh, in the southern hemisphere, we see this very large Mido, which of course, which I would take it just have to say is also very a fairly short. But um, uh, we see positive trends, and then a little positive, but maybe not significant at um, maybe not significant at arrival heights. For many um, sites in the northern mid-latitudes, I would say excluding Toronto, um, 
maybe in Paris, central Paris, and at Thule, um, very low mixed to negative trends in the troposphere. Um, and I would say the Thule, Thule actually is on, in part on account of very high values we've seen at a couple of springs, and especially in the spring of 2016 has really changed the, the trend line, but it was fairly anomalous. Um, there's been a lot of work to look at anomalous, anomalous or di di dynamical variability in the stratosphere, and we wanted to take advantage of, of any kind of method in which we could try to exclude dynamic variability um, in the stratosphere. So looking just now at stratosphere trends, because the, we have the, the instrumentation also measures N2O, that's one of the man, man, mandatory species, we're able to take the stratospheric value of, the, of N2O and, um, and regress um, using that, using the N2O. This sort of follows work from um, Rich Delarski and all, which, who did this with um, HCl and nitric acid, and then also with Jeff Toon did a similar, a similar process looking at, looking at the uh, Mark IV balloon data. Um, so we do a regression with this, but prior to this, we know that, that N2O is increasing by about a quarter percent per year. So we, we remove that and, uh, and then do a linear trend uh, taking into account any variability given, uh, given by N2O. And then we decided to do this only with, for the longest uh, running sites. And we wanted to do it using, um, to be sort of homogeneous and try to look at. So we started in 2001. So this is basically um, a nine sites with a 20 year record, but stretched from 76 north to 80, 78 south. Here's a couple of examples of, uh, of these trends over this time period. And then on the right shows the, uh, a correlation. So I okay, got an R value of nine. We're highly correlated between N2O and, uh, and OCS. And uh, we performed this, this regression, and these plots show uh, some statistics and the regression. So we wanted to know, of course, if it's improved anything. So on the left, or improved our fit, or if we would trust it better. On the left, <clears throat> excuse me, is a comparison between, in red, our, uh, our linear plus uh, Fourier terms that we would, did in our standard retrieval, and our trends. And uh, the green is the regression with uh, N2O. And so if we're looking at the residuals or the, you know, that, that uh, an RMS of the fit, we would expect lower values. And indeed we get lower values, nothing earth, earth shaking, but an improvement in, uh, in all but, excuse me, in all um, but lauder, where um, we actually get a slight increase. This is the R value in the center plot where we might expect to or would hope for a larger, a slightly larger value using the N2O regression, which we do. And um, except for Mauna Loa and, um, and Lauder Station. So, so we feel like this is an improvement, should present an improvement to the trends. And then on the right hand side are the are the trends compared with a previous version. So the green now are the are still the uh, fit with N2O. They're all slightly larger um, through the northern hemisphere, but I would say, and um, higher at arrival heights, but it tends to go down at Lauder. And then um, at Mauna Loa at 20 north, Wollongong is about 34 south, I believe. We see uh, we see negative trends, although Mauna Loa got got more positive. Um, Wollongong got more negative, but I would say that um, we're working with the Wollongong group, and we we think that there's uh, issues with the retrieval, especially in the stratosphere. So I would say that the jury's out for that one right there. The other thing that jumps out at this is that this trend tends to increase uh, going south. So because uh, because we see this variation in the in the trend over the long term, and uh, 
we actually see it in all of all of the levels, not quite the same, but in all the levels, altitude levels. We try to do a stepwise multiple linear regression. So um, Shima was was uh, integral in doing this this work, and she looked at a number of different proxies over here on the on the left, and um, I would say, and uh, we're given a good example here and um, some fairly high um, correlations with, um, this is at Zugspitze, this is the total column, stratosphere, free trope, lower trope. These are the, the proxies are buried in there, the fit, you can hardly see, but it's the points to this, this beige line. And what were the, the result of this, so we did this for all the levels and all the stations. Um, the result though didn't present a sort of cumulative picture that we said, oh, you know, the, and the OCS is really changing because of this, or in this latitude range, all of the sites are because of this. Uh, we never saw that. And so this leads us to believe that there's some other, other, other components, per, you know, sources likely, uh, probably anthropogenic, but think clearly things that aren't related to dynamics that we might normally um, think of or sea surface temperature. Um, which may have to do with the with uh, how much OCS is coming out of the oceans, or veg the vegetation index, or chlorophyll. It might have to do with uptake. These kinds of things didn't really prove to us uh, prove sort of generally to answer the answer the questions on the variability. So moving on a little from from trends, this is a plot of. Um, all of the uh, an average of all of the mixing ratios in the three ranges as a function of latitude and i just want to show this in um as a couple features here like for, for instance um it's very interesting that um in the stratosphere we see we see fairly low values in this sort of 20 especially near 30 uh 30 degree south in the in the um, southern hemisphere, but also similar, similarly in the um, in the northern hemisphere, then a gradual a gradual increase as we head north. We also see similar um, decreases in the tropospheric values, um, in the in the uh, free tropospheric values, but slightly increase in the north as they go as we head north. Um, there's a interesting phenomenon that um, Steve Monska points out about a drawdown at about 45 degrees north and we tend to see this here averaged over a, a number of sites but tend to see a slight a slight dip between here so that that feature seems seems to be ubiquitous um, and then these are these are uh, annual cycles for all the stations the columns then are divided up by their by our latitude bins and it's stratosphere, free trope, and lower trope from from uh, top to bottom. And uh, a few things are evident here. Um, we see a, we see a, you know peaks in the far in the north here later, uh, kind of late in the late summer autumn. Um, a clear clearly a drawdown in the autumn, and these are separated really by the high latitudes and the not as high latitudes. I think these are Saint Petersburg and Bremen right here. And the highest ones in the Arctic and, and, and high, high above the Arctic Circle draw down much lower. We see very low values at Eureka early in the year, so February, it's February, March. Um, Eureka is quite ice, ice locked um, in the early spring, as opposed to um, Nialsand or, or uh, Thule. Uh, Thule has, um, is uh, coastal and has a uh, Polynya nearby and uh, variations in the uh, freeze and thaw of the of the Kane, Kane Strait and the and through the Baffin Bay that may have effect on that. So there's a quite a com, quite a comparison. Um, other interesting features here are, I think are um, this drawdown that's seen at um, the two southern hemisphere mid latitude uh, stations so Lauder and Wollongong not seen in the Reunion Island stations. It's pretty, pretty much not a seasonal cycle in the free troposphere or, or uh, our lower troposphere. Okay, and so here I'd like to just uh, wrap up by, by uh, some conclusions. 
that um, we've developed a, a global homogeneous long-term data set up to 35 years. Um, we've determined trends in three, rain, three latitude ranges. Um, we determined lifetimes. I didn't get into that much here, from the, but all across these latitude ranges. Um, the trends are not linear, but are generally increasing. The, there's our inflection points that um, need further study. We want to pursue this maybe by latitude and station um, rather than a sort of a more, a more global view that we've tried to, tried to present here today. Uh, the trends don't really generally follow dynamical proxies or things like chlorophyll or sea surface temperature, things that we have here on hand. Um, but we think that we should be able to do something here, perhaps include anthropogenic um, sources in, uh, and try to understand them, a little, understand them a little better that way. We've incorporated N2O as a dynamical proxy for the stratosphere. And uh, these seem to these are, seem appropriate and also improves our statistics and find these to be probably the most uh, uh, cohesive or, and best way to estimate stratosphere trends. And to that end, these trends are between two and 0.75% per year. And, and that is also uh, counter to most trends. So we would say that the OCS stratospheric budget is not necessarily in equilibrium, but there's a buildup of OCS. Um, we didn't really get to it here because we really don't have enough data, but 2018 seems to have started a new trend uh, in a downturn. And uh, we might be able to say just a little bit about that uh, as soon as we get the rest of 2020 data. And uh, finally, uh, I want to thank all of the uh, all of my colleagues in the infrared working group that have contributed to this. Um, it's a lot of work for a lot of people to independent groups to do this to put, pull this uh, pull this kind of uh, measurement and long term analysis off. And uh, some of these sites are now in multi generational uh, uh, support. And uh, I'm very much indebted to them. So, and thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Jim. That was interesting. All right, so everyone, so if you have questions, please go to Slido and type the questions and I can pass them to Jim. Uh, we know Slido is a bit slow, so please type your questions now and I will read them. I guess in the meantime, I can I can start with some questions, <laughs> even though I might know this or not. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, there is a question now from Eric. Okay, I can read the question, Jim, and then you can also see it if you want yeah. to. But one of the intriguing things about OCS is that it could, in theory, provide a context for estimates of global photosynthesis. Are these data valuable with regard to this? What does the increase in trend tell us, if anything? Well, I think I think that it can. I think that um, I think that it can tell us something about. It is being used currently to tell us something about uh, global photosynthesis. I think that um, that's really gone into really well in the paper by Whalen, and there's already there's been a, a, a one study by uh, Wang et al. that's gone into this, and so. I think that I think that with this data set, now we have a we have a homogeneous data set of, across a number of different regions and uh, sort of eco zones that we can look at and and try to understand photosynthesis from that from that perspective, which we haven't been able to before. I think that the context, like like a lot of things, we're looking at sources and sinks and drawdowns and and the wider budget. Um, in order to say something specific about the photosynthetic component, the wider budget needs to be better understood. And so that's, we're hoping to contribute to that with this regression analysis and trying to look at that. Um, I think the increasing trend is really telling us that, that, that um, the drawdowns are not limiting that, that these other, there are other sources that are dominating. Yeah but they need to be understood a little more quantitatively. Thanks for that. So 
are there any other stratospheric uh, observations that can be used to see trends or these are the only ones? Okay, there, you know, there are satellite measurements, but they're ACE um, and I don't know that MEPAS is, do, is able to anymore, but ACE, I would imagine ACE would come back. Their initial uh, sets of observations were, were really a snapshot and an introduction to OCS. They only had data at that point for a few years. So I might expect uh, that they might come back with a, a longer term trends. Um, but there are not very many, there are not many, very many satellite measurements or in situ measurements in the stratosphere. Yeah. yeah. There are a couple of more questions uh, yeah. from Bill Rander. You pointed out several stations with anomalously low stratospheric values. Do you think this is a problem with the measurements or retrievals at those stations? So the, the one, the, really the one that I pointed out was Wollongong and, I, and I've been in touch with them. And we think that it has something to do with their, their, how they did their retrieval. Um, they, I don't think, for all that I said about, about creating the, a sort of strategy with a priori's and all this stuff, I think they did something slightly different. And um, so we're working on that. And that, that was really the main, the main station that, um, where, where something's not really not out of line. So uh, for the large part, I think the rest of the the rest of the stations really present a pretty compelling global view. There is another question from Ben. Uh, is there is there an ongoing project to compare satellite retrievals and ENDAC? He's thinking about EASI. Yeah, I think that I think that that is is ongoing. There's been a number of of uh, of um, Satellite comparisons with EASI, I think they're, I think they're based. They usually are derived, honestly, from the from the EASI people, and they're trying to understand their data in, in a better context. And so, uh, so we're one of the few. In, the NDAC infrared instruments are some of the few measurements that they can that they are global in nature, that they can compare to. So, um, so it really, it really originates there. There's a lot of there's been a lot of work with uh, ammonia. Um, I think some, I think methane, uh, but I don't, I don't know of any that's actually ongoing right now. Yeah. Okay. I don't see more questions for now, I guess we can wait a little bit. Okay. Uh, so are you, are you gonna try to get 2020 for all sites? Yeah, I think we'll be able to get 2020 for all sites in a short period of time and uh, incorporate that. It's in, it is interesting that it's after 28, what is, what is 2018, 2018 is, is decreasing? It started to increase. Had we not, had we not seen 2019, 2020 data at a couple of sites, we might have, we might have considered just to be increasing. So it's really, uh, it's, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see more questions. If there are no more questions, uh, thank you, Jim. It was okay. very interesting. And thanks everyone for joining today. We will have another seminar next week. Uh, yeah, thank you everyone. Okay, thanks, thank you. Jim.